So today we're going over human wildlife conflict. And we are going to start out by defining human wildlife conflict. Um, so when we talk about human wildlife conflict, generally we're referring to negative interactions between humans and wild animals um, that have some sort of desi undesirable outcome, um, either for people or for wildlife. So it doesn't have to be entirely one-sided. Um, areas that we most frequently see um, HWC, um, especially here in Montana, would be trash management, which I'm sure most, if not all of you, are aware of. Um, encroachment, uh, both when humans get too close to wildlife habitat and when wildlife gets too close to human habitat. Um, crop damage or loss, livestock injury or loss, and then perceived or actual danger. Um, and when I say perceived and actual danger, just to elaborate on that, um, we are seeing kind of an increase in uh, concern about wildlife um, that has kind of risen when it comes to surveillance. So stuff like ring cameras um, has made people more aware of what animals are in their, in their area, um, especially when they're not home or when it's nighttime. Um, so that's kind of led to a little more fear when it comes to like predators that they're seeing um, or other like kind of pest animals. I use quotations because for obvious reasons, uh, pest is a very open, open concept. <laughs> Okay, so how is human wildlife conflict caused? Um, so one of the big causes is habitat, habitat change, um, and that kind of inc includes four different types of habitat change, um, and this is human caused. So habitat fragmentation, um, that's when habitat is interrupted or the connections between different types of habitat are destroyed. Um, and this creates smaller isolated areas. So when you think of, I mean, the easiest example is going to be like when we create highways through areas like, I mean, any of our highways. Um, we're dividing uh, habitat that may be, especially animals that are far ranging, um, those animals use, are used to passing through kind of uninhibited. Um, and now they have this really risky process of having to cross highways, cross freeways, um, kind of navigate in between man-made structures like power lines. Um, so it's a very different experience for them than if we hadn't uh, divided those areas. Um, this can be a big problem when it comes to migration. Um, and it can be a big problem for animals that require um, travel to mate. So a lot of animals, for example, mountain lions, are not, they don't live with their mates. Um, they have to travel. Males keep pretty big territories. Um, and so creating that habitat fragmentation can be really detrimental to both um, the ability to reproduce and then reproductive success. Um, it also can cause genetic isolation, um, which makes animals more vulnerable to diseases and then to genetic abnormalities caused by inbreeding. Um, then we have habitat degradation. So that's going to be more of uh, caused by um, some sort of habitat decline, so in quality or resources. Um, that can include pollution, uh, an increase in invasive species, such as uh, the mussels that we talked about way back in aquatic invasive species. Uh, feral cats are another one. Um, just anything that's introduced that shouldn't be there. Um, and then over-exploitation. Um, so what do you guys think of when I say over-exploitation of a, of a resource? What? Clear cutting, great. Anything else? That's a really good one, yeah. So un unsustainable harvest of, of things like huckleberries, which are super important food source. Um, another example is just a lot of human traffic. So during COVID, we saw a lot of increases in traffic um, in natural areas because people were trying to get away from other people. Um, and that can cause some problems, especially when it's areas that are a little more fragile or have um, sensitive species. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about how to help this later on, but there are ways to minimize the effects of traffic. Um, and then we have habitat encroachment, which is human proximity to wild areas increases um, as we expand outward from cities. Um, and this leads to more opportunities for human wildlife conflict. So just kind of logical, if we get closer to them, we have a more chance of interacting and possibly in negative ways. 
Um, habitat loss is going to be when natural habitats and wilderness areas are entirely redeveloped or repurposed, and that's for our human use. That can be taking over an area with apartments, or it can be turning as an area into a quarry or mining um, that just makes it unsuitable for wildlife. And then we have wildlife habituation and food conditioning. So um, habituation is a learned behavior. Um, and so that's after repeated exposure with no negative consequences, an animal becomes desensitized to a certain stimuli. So if an animal um, encounters people multiple times without any sort of negative response, they're going to be less concerned when they see a human in the future, right? Because nothing bad happened all the times before. Um, food conditioning is when we talk about an animal beginning to associate something with a reward, and food is a very powerful reward. Um, so when they start to associate a stimuli like a trash can left out, or being at a certain campsite where people tend to leave food everywhere, like on a, a table at a campsite, um, that can be conditioning them to associate us with food. So this is an example of that habitat fragmentation. Um, one example that was in the news recently was P22, the mountain lion in California. Um, so P22 managed to cross 10 lanes of highway traffic. That was US 101 um, and a lot of other obstacles that kill most of the other mountain lions that attempt it. Um, and he was able to get into the, the Hollywood Hills and he became kind of a, a regional hero. Uh, people were very attached to P22. Um, unfortunately, recently he passed away after being hit by a car and suffering some age-related issues that he just couldn't recover from. Um, he's also, fun fact, responsible for, I think, what must be the only case of a koala being eaten by a mountain lion in the US. Uh, he broke into the Los Angeles Zoo and ate the koala um, and suffered no consequences because, again, uh, regional hero status. <laughs> But um, so this is an example of what we can use to mitigate that habitat fragmentation. Um, if you've been up US 93, you probably saw a bridge just like this one. It's a super cool example that we'll talk about in a little bit. So how is it managed? So anybody who talks about human wildlife conflict management is going to be talking about how it's more human management than it is wildlife management. Um, and that often surprises people that get into the wildlife field thinking that it's going to be 90% wildlife and 10% human. Uh, it's not. <laughs> it ends up being a lot more closer to 50-50 if not on the human heavy side. Um, the more resources humans are provided, the easier it is for animals to coexist with us. Um, and this can be uh, especially true when we have aspects of poverty, inequality, and lack of resources in a certain area. Um, or for a certain people. So when we have wildlife uh, or losses to livestock or pets caused by wildlife, um, that's going to have a very different impact for people who are financially insecure versus people who are financially secure. Um, losing a, one cow in a huge herd, probably not going to be the biggest you know, battle for somebody to overcome. Um, losing one cow out of two cows that you have, that's going to be much, much bigger of an issue. Um, we also see this when we look at, you know, areas in Africa that grow crops to literally sustain themselves um, and their families. Um, and so when those crops are destroyed by elephants, they don't think favorably about elephants, whereas people who live in the city who don't have to deal with that uh, wildlife impact, they love elephants. So it can create this, this um, divide in between humans um, where we argue against each other about how we should be dealing with things. Um, one group doesn't think there's a problem. The other group is having these problems impact their daily life or even their survival. Um, this draws into poaching. So often it's desperation rather than maliciousness, at least at that base level, um, when you get into who's directing and who's moving you know, the products, that can be more of a, a criminal syndicate type of thing. Um, but at the base level, when you have poaching for hunting, for food, um, that's often due to people just trying to survive rather than people trying to be malicious or exterminate an animal. Um, people, when they're concerned about their daily survival, are not going to be able to focus on the long-term survival of a species. So the more we support humans in their daily survival and their daily well-being, the better we can kind of continue and further those uh, efforts to protect wildlife. Um, pest species might be also uh, associated with social stigmas of certain classes. 
Uh, there is a book on your list that's called Pests, Accidental Wildlife Fellows. Uh, I can't remember the subtitle. Um, read it if you'd like to learn more about this. It's great. Um, and then lack of access to wildlife education um, is a really big thing. So if you don't know how to interpret wildlife behaviors, if you don't know how to avoid wildlife, um, that's going to really change either how much you encounter human-wildlife conflict or how you can recover from it. So these are some six management strategies that I'm just going to go over really quickly. Um, these are not all of the management strategies that are in place. Um, these are just what we're going to cover. They're some of the biggest ones that I think are in place. Um, one of the what, most important ones being avoidance. Um, so if we limit the opportunities for human-wildlife conflict, um, especially just by avoiding wildlife, then we go a long ways in preventing human-wildlife conflict from ever happening in the first place. So it's much easier than uh, deconditioning an animal or moving them or whatever else. If we can avoid it entirely, awesome. Uh, example, do not pet bison. Um, don't keep wildlife as pets. That's bad. Don't feed raccoons. Also bad. Um, you're going to see this a lot on social media. I've noticed, at least in my Ex, you know, in my adventures on social media apps, a lot of what's suggested to me as an animal lover is going to be stuff that shows inappropriate wildlife contact. Don't be afraid to go on there and be like, hey, this isn't a great way to interact with wildlife. The, the purpose of doing a class like this is to make sure that you guys have the tools you need to advocate not only within your community for wildlife and our local ecosystem, but also in general for wildlife. Um, you will face backlash on social media, but it's worth it. <laughs> um, other examples you can read right there. Um, taking down bird feeders at appropriate times. Um, securing your trash is really big. Making sure neighbors secure their trash is also really big, because even if you do everything right, the guy down the street doesn't. You still have a conditioned bear or raccoons or whatever else. Um, and then driving slower and being conscious of you know high uh, wildlife crossing traffic um, or times where it's most uh, most frequent, that's also really important. Another example of wildlife safety, keep your distance and good luck. Mitigation, so is when we reduce the impact of human wildlife conflict. So oftentimes some cannot be avoided, so like highways and freeways, we rely on those to get around, to get goods around, to travel. Um, so how can we make that impact lesser on wildlife? One of those examples is the Animals Bridge um, that the Flathead Reservation has. Um, they actually have a bunch of bridges and culverts um, in the area um, that have been pretty successful, um, especially when used with wildlife fencing. Um, that allows wildlife to be fenced away from the roadways and then to have a crossing where they can actually intersect and travel where they need to. Um, and that's related to what type of habitat something? Habitat fragmentation, awesome. Um, wildlife preserves and closures are really important too. So if we have areas that can preserve wildlife, preserve somewhat of a wild habitat, um, and limit human, tra human traffic. So parks often close at night, right? And that's partly for human safety, but also because nocturnal animals and more sensitive species We'll have kind of that break from humans for a little bit and let them go about their business. Um, it also decreases the chance of uh, human wildlife conflict in terms of, you know, predators hunting at night or any of those other concerns. Um, wind turbine alterations, uh, if we can especially do that for bats, we've done a lot of studies recently that show slowing down wind turbines during low wind action um, and then during peak migration season makes a really big difference in uh, bat fatalities. Unfortunately, we don't really have the policy changes in place to make companies do that, so they oftentimes don't. Um, and then loss compensation. That's a really big portion of um, uh, wildlife conflict mitigation. Um, when we're able to compensate livestock owners for their losses, um, which we do in Montana for uh, confirmed and probable losses to grizzly bears, wolves, and mountain lions. Um, it's, it tends to make a, a little bit of a more tolerance. Uh, it builds more tolerance for cohabitating with these predators. 
that's the uh, results for 2023 for our compensation. Um, these were the fatalities that we saw that were at least confirmed or uh, probable. Um, people have to report and then it gets um, investigated. And then those are some of the animals that we see using the culverts or the bridges. So it does get good use and those have been pretty successful, uh, not just here but around the country as well. Education, that's what you guys are doing. Um, so peer-to-peer -peer education is super important. Um, if we can advocate for our local community, our local wildlife, um, and on social media, like I said before. Um, education also in evaluating sources. So if we are able to look at a source and say, yeah, that's probably a reputable source, that furthers our education and our, our perceptions of wildlife a lot better. Um, for example, which of these two pictures do you think is a more reliable source about raccoons? Probably the person who's wearing gloves and not kissing a raccoon. Um, <laughs> Raccoons can transmit diseases, even if they're pets. So please don't kiss raccoons and don't feed them. Uh, leave that up to the trained rehabilitators. They're really good at their job for a reason. Um, early education is also super important. Um, when we're able to educate ch children on wildlife importance and avoidance of conflict, they carry those lessons throughout their life. Um, and that makes a big difference on, on reducing that probability of human wildlife conflict. Um, incorporating feedback, especially when it comes to policy decisions um, and conflict uh, management or incident response, um, to make sure that everybody's being heard. Um, sometimes everybody's opinions can't be put in place, but at least if people are being heard, that makes things a little less uh, uh, fiery and angry. <laughs> Um, and then outreach with high-risk populations, so people that are most at risk of, of human-wildlife conflict, like when you go to a national park and they hand you, or a state park, um, and they hand you a little pamphlet about, hey, please don't leave your food unsecured. That's an example of high-risk outreach. Deterrence, you're actively taking steps to deter wildlife from an area. Um, an example of this is livestock guardian dogs. Those are my uh, best friend's three livestock guardian dogs. They're super effective. Um, I didn't want to walk into her yard for the first three years that I knew her. Uh, that guy is like 250 pounds, He's huge, terrifying. He's a great dog. But um, they're super effective in deterring animals from coming in. Um, shepherds are also really good, so not leaving wildlife to roam freely. Um, electric fencing, you've probably seen some sort of electric fencing here in the Missoula area. Um, my community garden that I live next to has electric fencing. Um, solar floodlights, those are um, usually motion activated or set to a random pattern. Um, and that coupled with noise like a radio playing or a podcast playing on speakers can make animals think that somebody's there. And usually they're gonna be deterred by human presence even if it's not actually present. So setting that up around a chicken coop can be really effective. Um, and then counter conditioning. So in introducing a negative stimuli when they see you. So instead of just having them see a person, have nothing bad happen and move on, start having a, you know, an air horn when a bear gets too close to your house or, you know, something that creates that negative stimuli that makes them think, yeah, I'm going to avoid the big uh, hairless apes and go somewhere else. Relocation. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about this because it's not really in my wheelhouse. Um, it can have mixed results. Um, again, the best thing that we can do is not l do things to lead to a situation that relocation is needed. Um, when you have it done by a private person on, you know, like they trap a coyote and then take it all the way over to a, you know, wild range and let it go, that's probably not a great thing to do. It's probably also illegal. Um, people do this a lot with squirrels, at least in the city that I'm from. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Go for it. Um, which also is just moving the problem sometimes. Um, however, when it's done by a qualified agency um, and they're able to assess all the different factors that go into finding suitable habitat and make sure that animals don't either A, continue to cause a problem or B, um, make their way back or try to go back, um, that can be a lot more effective. Uh, one example of this is gonna be bat exclusion. So when you have bats in an area that you don't want them to be, um, you can do a one-way door that's put in through a qualified humane agency 
Um, and the reason that we say have a professional do it is because timing is really important. So if you install it during pup season, um, you're going to have mothers flying out and unable to get back in. And that's going to cause a lot of fatalities. Um, also, don't do it too close to winter because then bats don't have enough time to go and find a new roost to overwinter. Um, that's Bear 609 of the Great Smoky Mountains. Um, she walked 1,000 miles to get back to where she was um, because she had a really good setup. She had a nice campsite that there was always food left over at. Um, they relocated her to somewhere a little more uh, distant and away from people, and that was still not enough. Um, yeah. Again, it's, it's this avoiding the point where we have to do, uh, that we have to make interventions. Um, then lethal control, which is nobody's favorite subject or outcome. Um, as I mentioned in our mammalogy class, um, coyotes and wolves had mange introduced into their populations at one point in an attempt to control their populations through disease. Um, that did not work because coyotes are incredibly resilient. Um, it did spread a lot of mange, though. Um, so a bit of a fumble on part of the 1905 Montana government. Um, that ended in 1916. We don't do that now, <laughs> obviously. Um, when it comes to culling, so that's kind of the mass lethal control of a population. Um, bounties were common in 20th centuries, uh, or in the 20th century. Often this began right at colonization, um, as people were trying to control the predation on their livestock, um, and then to control the, the amount of predation that were on, you know, game species like deer. Um, sometimes it's still used today, can be in positive ways too, because we have bounties out on invasive species like the pythons in Florida. Um, people get paid for each python that they bring in, or there can be tournaments where they win a prize. Um, here in Montana, um, Flathead Lake has a lake trout bounty or a, a tournament where it's like catch the most lake trout and you get a prize. Um, so these types of controls do have their place in wildlife management. It's not, so when you hear lethal control, try to evaluate all the aspects. Um, it can be hard because nobody wants animals to die. That's not a fun thing to think about, but um, ecology is one of those things where not everything is gonna be a happy outcome. Um, we also have euthanasia. That tends to be case specific. Um, it's usually linked to liability, multiple incidents, or dangerous circumstances, or all of the above. Um, for example, we had a case in Yellowstone National Park a while back where um, a mother killed uh, a mother grizzly bear, not just a mother, um, a mother, mother grizzly bear um, had a fatal encounter with somebody who surprised her. Um, she wasn't euthanized at that point because that's considered a natural behavior for a mother grizzly bear to react protectively of her cubs. Um, but later she was found at the same uh, site of another human fatality, um, and so they euthanized her at that point because if the park lets a problem bear, um, even though we don't know for sure that she was involved in the second fatality, um, that opens them up to a lot of liability um, because we don't want to be accused of having the killer bear, we knowing about the killer bear that's out there um, and not intervening. So, um, and then the strike system. So as you might have heard that there is more and more efforts to defer lethal control for especially case by case uh, instances. Um, the strike system is one example of that. Um, the one that I know most about is in California, which Ironically, they also have for people, but that's a separate thing. Um, so the strike system is that if an animal is predating on your livestock or domestic animals, they have to have three documented cases of your efforts to non-lethally deter that animal. So you have to be putting into place some of these efforts to deter, so electric fences, livestock guardian dogs, taking your livestock in if it's possible and putting them in an enclosure if you have a few enough livestock. Um, and only at that point, at that th third strike, will they issue a depredation um, license. Um, so basically, it's a good thing that we're trying more and more to uh, increase our toolbox and make more efforts towards non-lethal management and 
there's a lot of government and nonprofit support for those non-lethal tools. So if people cannot afford to put in an electric fence, there are agencies that will help you either defer the cost or pay for it entirely. So that's a really cool thing. Can Maine still pay it? It can. Yeah. Yeah, so I think the death rate was anticipated to be higher um, when it came to, to mange. Um, it, again, coyotes are incredibly resilient. Um, and some degree of mange would have been in the population anyways, um, but it was kind of a, we instituted a lot heavier uh, uh, load of that, so <laughs> it wasn't great. <laughs> okay, and now Jamie is going to talk to you about black bears, and do you also do grizzly bear management? And grizzly bears. Um, he knows way more than I do about this, so if I said anything wrong, please correct me. <laughs> awesome. I'll give you. Well, sorry, I don't have a PowerPoint. I had a crazy day. Um, but uh, my name is uh, Jamie Jonkel, and uh, I'm part of a bear management team here in Region 2, Missoula. I work with a fellow named Eli Hampson, who uh, does most of our mountain lion management here around town. And then he helps out with all of the uh, grizzly conflicts. I also work with uh, a fellow named Bruce Montgomery, who focuses just down the Bitterroot. Uh, Bitterroot is, uh, let's just say, a nightmare right now. Um, we've got so many people living down the Bitterroot uh, and moving into the Bitterroot in the last 15, 20 years. It's just gotten out of control down there. Uh, we call it the land of two million garbage cans. And uh, pretty much all of our black bears are food conditioned down there in the Bitterroot. So we're uh, you know, trying to uh, make some inroads in the county, we're Valley County right now. Uh, we've got a good work group down there, and uh, we're just starting to meet with the commissioners, in fact, uh, this week, to kind of bounce some ideas off them to see if they'll, uh, you know, start uh, doing some of the s similar things that Missoula County is doing in regard to uh, Bear Wise. Um, I also work with a fellow named uh, Brad Ballas, who does the same thing. But he's focused in the Deer Lodge Valley. He's based out of uh, um, the Drummond area. And then uh, <clears throat> we have a really nice working relationship with an NGO, non-governmental agency, called the Blackfoot Challenge. And they have a person that uh, helps us or assists us with grizzly bear management, lion management, et cetera, in the Blackfoot Valley. And his name is Eric Graham. We also have a really good working relationship with uh, people in carnivores. Sorry. Um, and uh, we work with two people there, uh, Kim Johnson and oh, I forgot the other fellow's name. But uh, they kind of work in that uh, big hole, Dillon area, but assist us with here. And what's so nice about these NGO partnerships, you know, we. It's more people on the landscape, boots on the ground, to work with uh, the ranchers, the communities, to do good, more uh, preemptive type stuff. Um, so tonight, I wasn't quite sure what to talk to you about, but uh, uh, I thought uh, I would cover you know, the bear, the grizzly bear and black bear activity right around Missoula here, the mountain lion activity that's right around Missoula here, and uh, <laughs> moose and a few other things as well. Uh, if you want to really key into what's going on in Missoula, uh, Google up missoulabears.org and also the Missoula Bears Facebook page. Lots and lots of really good information there. And then you can actually communicate with me and the rest of the team on the Missoula Bears website. And uh, <laughs> just lots of really good information on there. But we have a weekly or bi-weekly update that kind of fills everyone in all over Region 2. So Region 2 uh, is the territory that we work in. And that takes in the Bitterroot, 
the lower Clark Fork down to about Paradise, uh, Quinn's Hot Springs, St. Regis, then up the Blackfoot to that uh, little pass in between Anaconda and Butte. And then we got all that uh, Phelpsburg, Anaconda country, all the Blackfoot Valley, all the Clearwater Valley. That's basically region two. And so we have to handle all the bear and lion and, and wildlife conflicts in that whole area. That's why we have such a big crew. <coughs> in the old days, it was just me. <laughs> and then for about uh, 20 years, it was uh, me and a fellow named Bob Wiesner, who was a very excellent uh, houndsman, mountain lion specialist. And I'm so happy we have all this help now because it really has gotten crazy. Um, like, I'm, I'm sure most of you probably grew up here in Missoula. Um, you know, in my lifetime, I've just seen tremendous change. Like the Bitterroot Valley, I used to get up there on St. Mary's Peak, and you'd see the little twinkling lights, you know, of Corvallis, Stevensville, Florence, and Hamilton. Now when I climb up there on top of St. Mary Peak at night, I mean, it's just big, a massive wall of lights in the whole valley. <laughs> and then Missoula's just changed <coughs> dramatically since I left high school. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> and in the last few years, we've really seen a, a lot of growth here in Missoula. You know, when COVID hit, boy, did we ever get a lot of people pour into Montana. Sadly, a lot of them, you know, pulled up stakes uh, from wherever they lived and took their life savings out and moved here. And now, you know, we're seeing the repercussions of that. The homeless situation in here in the Missoula area is just crazy right now. And some of the stories I could tell you about, uh, you know, these poor souls living up the Kim Williams Trail, trying to live in a, a cave or a, a old mine shaft up, up the, on Mount Sentinel, you know, uh, They've got to store their food there, bears coming in, lions, you know, prowling all over. So it's pretty crazy right now. Um, so I have worked on a lot of different wildlife projects. I've been the bear manager for Region 2 for 28 years now here in Missoula. It doesn't seem that long. But uh, um, prior to that, there was no bear manager here. And uh, there wasn't really that many bear conflicts. There weren't really that many grizzlies. <laughs> But since I've been here, holy smokes, uh, I've got to watch all sorts of cool changes occur in regard to black bears here in town. And then just watching the grizzlies slowly expanding into historic ranges has been fascinating. Um, prior to that, I worked down in Yellowstone Park for a long, long time. So I could tell you tons of bison stories. But essentially, all I did down there uh, was uh, research trapping for grizzlies. But at that time, they didn't have any bear managers to speak of, other than wildlife services, the Department of Agriculture's wildlife services. They uh, did trapping for depredation, you know, and it was mostly lethal control. But when we were down in Yellowstone, we were the only people that were trained up to trap and handle grizzly bears. And as a result, we got to cover Idaho, Wyoming, and Montana. And we kind of worked that whole area. And so we were always getting lent out, you know, wherever the, bear, the grizzly bear conflicts occurred. It was a wonderful time period. Uh, before that, I worked in Maine on a black bear study. And then my father ran the Border Grizzly Project here in Montana. So when I was a kid, I got to hang out with Dad and do all sorts of cool black bear and grizzly bear work. I also got to go to Russia for a little bit, work on tigers and leopards and, and the brown bear over there and the Eurasian black bear. Uh, but I was awfully glad when I got back here to Missoula because this is where I grew up and this is where my family was. So I was tickled to get on with FWP. Um, so Missoula is extremely unique compared to other areas in Montana. Montana is just flat unique and so is Idaho and Wyoming when you compare it to the rest of the United States. I hate to say it, the rest of the United States is pretty much screwed. There, there's some nice country in, in New Mexico, there's some nice country, you know, in California, but it's just uh, human influenced, human dominated. But here in the Rocky Mountain West, we still have a fairly intact 
ecosystem. You know, it's because of the federal lands. And we have all this beautiful Forest Service land, all this beautiful BLM land, you know, and it essentially abuts up to Canada. And it's just like a, a, a dagger of wildness going down through the Rockies. And here in Montana, it's as wild, if not wilder, than it was uh, when uh, European man first showed up here. Uh, you know, when we showed up here in the 14, late, early, mid 1400s, you know, there were buffalo here, there were grizzlies here, there were antelope, you know, this whole valley was just a wildlife nirvana. But it was different than it is now. Uh, very slowly, you know, with uh, the introduction of horses, you know, Native Americans, uh, we started seeing changes to the hunting of wildlife. Uh, everything started going out of equilibrium. And then when uh, the French and when the British and the Spanish first sort of started making inroads, into this country in the Rocky Mountain West by the 1500s, uh, <coughs> 1600s, 1700s. You know, we just started whacking the wildlife big time, market hunting, trapping, that sort of stuff. And by the 1800s, I mean, our populations were getting decimated. And by the late 1800s and early 1900s, I mean, it, it was gone. It was changed. But what's so interesting is in the last 25 years to 30 years, we're seeing wildlife come back. And a lot of it's because of the Endangered Species Act. It's, a lot of it's because of the protections on the Forest Service lands check, check, check. and other rules and regs out there. But we're actually seeing, like Missoula is wild, check. I think, than Yellowstone National Park. Yellowstone National Park blew me away when I was working down there. It was like being in New York City for wildlife. You know, it was just, there was constant activity going on down there with bison, with elk, with grizzly bears, you know, and, and it was all right there in front of you. It's very similar to that here in Missoula. And what we got going on in the Missoula area is we're kind of on a, a fracture zone in the Rocky Mountains. You know, the five valleys is what they call this area. If you look at it uh, on Google Earth, it just sticks out like a sore thumb. It's this fracture zone in the, in the Rocky Mountains. There's another one up there in Alberta by the Old Man River. It's another fracture zone. And what's unique about these fracture zones, like right here in Missoula, you know, if you look at all these valleys coming together, all these mountain ranges coming together, all these hundreds of little streams and creeks all coming together, ridges, finger ridges, all kind of pooling together, it just creates this amazing sort of habitat and, a, and lots of variations, lots of different aspects, north slopes, south slopes. We've got, you know, everywhere you look, if you did a circle, you know, looking at all the mountains around you, you know, each one of these little mountain ranges has its own two or three herds of elk, its own mule deer herds, you know, its own um, bighorn sheep groups, its own you know, population of, you know, black bears, uh, lions, uh, you name it. You know, it, it's just insane out there. Um, what has happened, though, like when in the 70s, we really started to build out into the side drainages, and we did indeed displace the wildlife. But at some point, oh, probably... 20 years ago, we started seeing what's called the urban wildlife phenomena. And it's where the wildlife were like, the heck with living up in the mountains. I'm going to move to town where there are all these delicious goodies. You know, even though there's a lot of people there, if I put up with all those people and treat them like cows, I can live there too and take advantage of this sort of uh, human-influenced uh, prime habitat. You know, down in the river bottoms where we are along the rivers and creeks, you know, that is the best of the best of the best wildlife habitat. In essence, it's like the cream. What, what we've done with all of our excessive watering and all the ornamental plants and all of our garbage cans and all of our bird feeders is we've turned that cream-like habitat into ice cream. 
And so right now, we're just seeing droves of wildlife in and around town. I mean, I, 10 years ago, I never used to see uh, mule deer or white-tailed deer over by my house by the mall. Now, I routinely see elk, or I mean, uh, white-tailed and mule deer around there. Um, you know, on the fringes and edges, we've just got gobs and gobs and gobs of deer. And it's the deer that are the driving force for all of our mountain lions. In the winter months, <laughs> you know, the lions kind of follow the migrations of the elk and the deer. So in the winter months is when we have most of our lion activity here in the valley floor. And at times, you know, we've had up to 100 different lions right on the edges of town. And I'm the one that gets all the reports, you know. Kelly Island, the Rattlesnake, Butler Creek, Mount Sentinel. So there's a lot of mountain lion activity in this, in this valley. If I had to guess on the number of black bears that we had, you know, like each of these drainages, you know, Rattlesnake, Butler, uh, Laval, uh, uh, Deep Creek, you know, Blue Mountain area, Paddy Canyon, each one of those drainages has its own little isolated group of black bears. And last year we had a food failure. Uh, it was just a localized food failure. We had plenty of berries, you know, like our most dependable berry here in the Missoula area for, for bears is hawthorn and chokecherry. You know, in other areas like up around Kalispell and Whitefish, it's huckleberry. We've got huckleberries here too, but it's not a dependable food source like our chokecherry and our hawthorn and our serviceberry. So routinely every fall, all of our bears come down into the river bottoms and the riparian areas and the side gulches to eat, you know, hawthorn and chokecherry. What happened last year is uh, we had a bountiful uh, chokecherry crop and a bountiful hawthorn crop. But they ripened early and then they dropped, mostly because of the heat. And, you know, so we've just been going through some weird weather patterns the last 15 years, you know, and it's... It's got everything kind of out of flux. But last year, we had all the bears come down out of the high country, pool in the Missoula Valley, start feeding on the berries, and then the berries became overripe, dropped, and they were gone. And then they shifted on the apples, but the apples weren't ripe yet. You know, and the apple crop last year was poor. So it was insane. We had bears all over Missoula. And usually on a normal year, what we see in the middle of town, you know, down along the river, down by Bernice's Bakery, uh, in the schoolyards are the little bears, you know, or the females with young that are kind of hurting. They're trying to avoid the big males, you know, that are taking all the good garbage on the sides of the valley floor. Last year, for the first time, what we started seeing in the middle of the valley, in the actual urban centers of Missoula, we're not these young bears and not these uh, females with young, with big adult males. I caught six, I think it was six big adult males just at Bernice's Bakery last year. And all these males were huge, you know, like 400 plus pounds. And, um, you know, the big males, wherever they are, that's the best of the best habitat, the best food sources. So last year, because of our food failure, Instead of staying on the fringes and hitting the garbage cans and the rattlesnake and Paddy Canyon and, and Blue Mountain, they actually came into town. Some of that was in reaction to all the good work that's been done in the rattlesnake and elsewhere. We're really pushing to try to make Missoula bear smart. And it's been this constant drumbeat, you know, like contain your garbage. Don't leave your garbage out all week. You know, use, use bear-resistant garbage cans. Don't have your bird feeders up. If you have chickens, you have chicken coops, or you raise rabbits, or you have goats, put electric fence around them. And very slowly, we're seeing the Missoula area sort of conforming to that. But, you know, we've got a bunch of bears that have been on the gravy train for quite a while. So in the next 10 years or so, sadly, we're going to have to probably remove, remove is a nice word for euthanize, some of our, our professionals. Uh, we've got a lot of these big adult males that have just become like a black lab, have gone into that bully mode, and they're walking right down the middle of streets during the day, entering home sites, that kind of thing. Um, so once we can get Missoula Bear Smart, you know, initiated and get 
some of the rules and regs changed, uh, get some ordinances, stronger ordinances set up uh, where people are required to have bear resistant garbage cans, etc. cetera. Um, over time, we're hoping to remove that memory out of the population by taking the worst of the offending bears out. But at the same time, giving the worst of the humans tickets <laughs> so that they, you know, start doing things right. And we're kind of hoping we'll re reach an equilibrium that we do see in some communities. Like um, Red Lodge, Montana has been pretty savvy uh, the last 20 years. They, they were way ahead of everyone else in Montana. They got bear resistant garbage cans in place. They've got some, you know, just common sense uh, rules, not really ordinances, but you know, look, we live in Red Lodge, so don't have 10 bird feeders in your yard and don't pour, pour a 50 pound bag of bird seed or millet or sunflower seeds on your porch every week to draw in all the wildlife. Um, we've got a lot of people here in the Missoula area that do that. It just drives me insane, you know, they'll be like, come on up here, drop this bird relocate him, you know, up to some place where he'll live a good life. You know, uh, he's getting into my bird seat every night, and uh, it's kind of annoying, you know, and I'll be like, mm, mm So right now, we do not trap on bird feeders. We do not trap on apple trees that have apples. We do not trap on garbage. And so before we can set a trap, or before we will set a trap for anyone, we almost insist that they contain all their attractants first, and they remove you know, all the desirables that might be luring in the bear. If it's a, a human safety issue, you know, we, we, we just trap it immediately. Uh, for example, um, this spring we've had to remove two bears already. Um, they were both young adult males that uh, you know, uh, mom booted out. They were two-year-olds. Uh, they were hanging around their moms, hitting garbage all last year. And the first thing they did was come right down in the Missoula Valley. And the one bear was in the rattlesnake. We were monitoring him, hazing him. But then he entered two houses and actually went inside both houses. And as soon as they crossed that boundary, you know, we, we pretty much have to destroy them. And so we did remove that bear. And then we had a little bear that was working uh, the campus. And he uh, jumped on uh, a couple homeless camp tents. You know, the, there was tons of food in there. Um, and then he was on campus and actually tried to get into one of the dorm windows. And uh, as a result, we had to put him down. But then he was finding plenty of garbage elsewhere, even in the rattlesnake, you know, where we have uh, the bear buffer zone that's been in place for 10 years now. We still have all these new students sort of moving into town, you know. Uh, my favorite houses are those sort of party houses uh, where 10 guys are running a little place and have pizza every night. You drive by there, you see the doors wide open, you see stacks of pizza boxes, you know, on the front porch. Uh, doors never closed, garbage always out, you know. It's just like every year we get new training grounds. Um, the mountain lions, um, oh, I'll talk real quick about grizzlies. We're starting to see quite a bit of grizzly activity in the Missoula area now. Uh, just uh, about four or five days ago, we got a really good photograph of an uh, adult male up by Snowball. And then uh, just two days ago, we had someone encounter a grizzly up Woods Gulch in the Rattlesnake Recreation Area. Um, last year, oh, we have a grizzly by Clinton as well. Last year, uh, two years ago, we had that female grizzly with the three cubs that was in the North Hills. She was hitting chicken coops and, and such. Uh, when they came out this spring, something happened. We, we think the female was shot. We think one of the siblings was shot. Uh, the third sibling, a little female, had her foot shot off. And then the uh, remaining sibling... Uh, she was healthy, but she was very thin. But, you know, when they came out of the den, they went right through the lower rattlesnake in a fresh snow. They were over in the Marshall Ski Area. And then uh, finally, we did trap them in Twin Creek, just up the Blackfoot a little bit, because we could see the one was missing a leg. 
Oh, she was so sick. It, 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 the infection had gone septic. Uh, she was just, uh, I couldn't believe that she was able to keep up with her sister. Uh, we did have to put her down. The other one we radio collared and, and took back up in the very head of Belmont Creek. She was doing fine, but then she came back down over there by Clearwater Junction, pause up area, and, and was, we think, hit by a car. Uh, we couldn't, couldn't quite figure out what the cause of death was. Um, right now we have a grizzly uh, working Potomac really hard. Uh, so it's just a matter of time before we start seeing a few grizzlies that are really garbage oriented like our black bears here. And I think that's one reason the county commissioners and, and the city council and the mayor all agreed to uh, Missoula becoming a bear smart community. Um, now, I could go on and on and on, but if you guys had specific questions about bear management or lion management or anything about wildlife at all, I could answer some of those questions if, if you would like. I have a question. When you talk about a, a bear smart community, are you talking about, I mean, I know what that means, and I know around us that people are getting to that point, but does that mean all through, through the entire valley, everyone will have um, like bear trash cans that, that they can't get into and that sort of thing? Correct. So in uh, the Missoula area here about 10 years ago, we did a big black bear study and we did a push with the council members and the mayor, and they endorsed the concept of having a, a bear buffer zone sort of set up in the city portions of the Missoula Valley where we had a garbage ordinance that required, you know, bear, bear savvy, bear smart, you know, containment of garbage. Um, it sort of worked, but, you know, like up the rattlesnake, you know, one guy living on the city side of the boundary, you know, will be doing everything right. But right across the street, it's county, and there'll be some guy with a, a, a pickup truck or an old trailer just brim full of garbage that he runs to the dump once a month or once a year. <laughs> um, so it wasn't working. And uh, we did see some progress made, but really... Uh, it wasn't working because our bear conflicts were on the rise. They were just shifting off to the areas that weren't covered by the ordinance. For example, um, East Missoula, uh, Bonner, Milltown, Piltsville, all the rattlesnake bears shifted over there. So, you know, the 45 black bears that are food conditioned in the rattlesnake drainage, they're still there checking things out but they aren't finding the goodies other than apples. They're going over and hitting Bonner and East Missoula hard. And um, so two years ago, like whenever anyone would call, you know, I'm like, hey, if you really want to help, call your commissioner, call your councilman, call the mayor, you know, and they just started getting barraged with uh, lots of uh, emails, uh, lots of letters, and then the press has been very, very helpful. The Missoulians have been very helpful, so is The Current, and just lots of good articles uh, where they, you know, explain sort of what's going on. And as a result, uh, the commissioners and the uh, uh, council and the mayor requested that we rekindle our Bear Buffer Zone work group and come up with a better plan for the entire valley. The, the commissioners would like to do maybe all of Missoula County, but that would go over like a sharp stick in the eye <laughs> in, good, in most of the portions of Missoula County. But they thought they'd start small. So they've created a boundary that goes almost to Lolo, but not quite, takes in Paddy Canyon, takes in all that Hayes Creek, O'Brien Creek, goes down into the Grass Valley, just this side of the Y. It actually goes to the Y. And then it takes up Rattlesnake, Butler Creek, all the county lands and city lands and then on into the mouth of Hellgate Canyon and it goes to Bactura and uh, then Bonner. Uh, so in that area if, if everything gets approved yes uh, it'll re they'll require bear resistant 
garbage cans for that whole area and just common sense sort of, you know, if you're going to have chickens, you can get an electric fence. There's programs to help you out. If you're going to raise goats, get an electric fence, you know. We'll see if it works. We'll make a study of it. And uh, then if it's very effective, you know, maybe we can kind of like creep it out into all of Missoula County. Um, what's interesting is people are watching Whitefish, watching Red Lodge, watching us. The little town of Alberton, you know, said, hey, we want to become Bear Smart. So I've got an active uh, effort that I'm working with in Alberton to make Alberton a Bear Smart community. The bitter, believe it or not, is sort of interested. We got one commissioner kind of on board. Uh, Seeley, got a work group there. You know, we've tried stuff in the past. We've been working diligently for 27 years, but it's tiny steps. If you try to push things on people and shove ideas down their throat, you know, they aren't going to go for it. So you just have to take tiny little steps, and you have to almost wait till things are out of control and half crazy. Like that woman that was killed in Ovando a few years, a few two years ago. I mean, that really <coughs> jolted the town. And it really jolted some of the other towns like Sealy, you know, and they're like, holy smokes, we better get our act together. Okay. You guys track the bands. Do you try to get there before it leaves the scene, or do you anticipate a return to that source? So, you know, there's these little individual bears. They always have a little glint in their eye. They're just like some of these kids you see running around town stealing cars and stuff. You just know that, you know, that's a little Jimmy bear. You know, little Jimmy is going to go to Deer Lodge someday, and little Jimmy the bear, you know, is going to be a, a holy terror. And so when we have a bear that sort of starts exhibiting these sort of habits, you know, we can usually, through our phone trees and our reporting program, sort of figure out where they're going and kind of get in front of them. And quite often, rather than setting a trap, we'll free dart them. You know, we'll, we'll get there as quickly as we can and we'll run them up a tree. Not a tall tree. Trees as tall as the ceiling are the best. <laughs> Where you can then dart them, you know, and, and help them down. And then uh, quite often, you know, we'll relocate a bear. Like the three strike method is sort of the old way. Um, we uh, always try to give most of our bears the benefit of, the, of doubt. You know, like, eh, could be lost in humanity. Uh, could be he just started up and just learning, you know, let's give him a, another chance, two chances, three chances, four chances. But then there's others, you know, you just see that little Jimmy, you know, that glint in their eye and you know that they're hell bound, you know. And a lot of times then with certain little bears, we will destroy them right off the bat, especially if they've entered a tent or, you know, uh, chased a mother down through Greeno Park pushing her stroller. That kind of stuff, you know, we're like, yeah, let's get rid of him. Um, <clears throat> but for trapping, like if a bear, let's say, breaks into a house, um, you know, we're like, okay, just call us, leave everything as is. What's the food he got into? Okay, just leave it there and we'll set. And then a lot of times you can catch the bear that was involved. Longer you keep the trap there, more likely you're going to catch some innocent bear, some other bear. Uh, just for fun, one year uh, in the rattlesnake in the fall, we had the use of that real fancy trap. I don't know if you guys have ever seen it in the, some of the newspapers, but it was a trap that, you know, you could set it from your computer. It would open up the door. If you, you could check it every morning, it would call your phone if, a, if the door came down. You could look inside uh, from, with, from the computer inside the trap. If the bear was hot, there was a button you could hit to mist the bear. If it was a bear you weren't interested in, you could release them. We had use of that trap just to see if we liked it. And we set it in the rattlesnake uh, uh, about halfway up on the north end of uh, Greeno Park, uh, between Greeno Park and Bugby Park. We had it set for 20 days. We caught 20 bears. Yeah, and I was just like, okay, how many bears do we have in the rattlesnake, you know? At times in the fall, I sometimes think we have 50 to 60 bears that are coming down for the apples. At times, I, I know for a fact that we'll have 200 bears working the perimeters of the Missoula Valley. 
you know, because they come down from each one of these sort of valleys and are these drainages and mountain ridges, you know. Uh, in fact, uh, we had another real bad food year about seven or eight years ago. Bad food years for bears are kind of like hard winters for elk and deer. And we don't really know what to expect each year because it's slightly different. You know, it's like doing a watercolor painting. You never know what you're going to get. This year, it's been so quiet. We've hardly had any issues at all. But the heat has come on now, starting to dry out, and the choke cherry and the hawthorn are coming on. <laughs> so I'm predicting that, you know, we're going to have just droves of bears showing up. Uh, about seven, eight years ago, we had a food failure, and we had cameras up on Point Six and uh, up on Stewart Peak that we were monitoring. And in just like a two-day period at both of the cameras, we started seeing like a bear an hour coming by. And uh, it's just like picture after picture after picture of all these black bears. And then all of a sudden, the whole valley was just full of bears. And uh, pretty crazy. Yeah, so. Yeah. I'm you talk a little bit about mountain lions. Yeah. So the mountain lions, um, so we do. We have a lot of mountain lions here. And what always drives me insane is when I see these guys or these gals with their spandex outfit on <laughs> and their earphones jogging at 4.30 in the morning. I'm like, oh my God, you know, don't you have any idea how many lions we have around here? And they're usually running, you know, on these sort of ghostly little paths, you know, right on the fringes of humanity where all the deer, you know, are feeding. <laughs> and uh, so I always get quite worried. We've had uh, two uh, incidents here in the Missoula area. <laughs> we had a little boy killed up at Evero Hill. He was only about two. And then we had uh, oh, about a 10-year-old boy attacked by a lion in Marshall Canyon. And the, he was it, with a group uh, uh, kind of on a field trip. And the uh, older boy was able to you know, uh, run the lion off. We've had lots and lots of uh, odd encounters. We've had an awful lot of dogs killed, a lot of cats killed. Not, cats are more or less part of the prey base now. Like when I'm out doing my, uh, when I used to do my deer and elk surveys with spotlights at night, even up high in the mountains, you know, we'd look for eye shine and then throw our binocs up and, and count the number of white-tailed deer, number of elk, etc. The most common thing I would see in my spotlight surveys at night, house cats. And even up in the mountains, you know, there's house cats everywhere that are feral, and they've in essence become part of the prey base. And so mountain lions are just like house cats, you know. They, they get real territorial. They get kind of pissy, especially if a, another mountain lion tom or a, even a house cat tom is pissing. <laughs> the mountain lion male will just get so upset when he finds where, you know, <laughs> what's this little thing doing, you know, peeing all over this yard area. And they get really, you know, they'll start peeing on top of house cat scrapes and we'll hunt house cats then. Uh, so we get a lot of house cats killed here. Um, so the big preventative stuff there is uh, like uh, people with salt licks. Um, like if you want to create uh, and shift the game trail systems, put a salt lick in your yard. And pretty soon all the game trails along the ridges and all the game trails along the creeks will like shift <laughs> and come through your backyard. And then you're in essence creating like a false game pocket where everything's coming for salt. And then the elk, I mean the uh, lions and the coyotes and the wolves and the foxes and the bears will key into it because there's such a concentration of, of deer using your salt lick in your yard. Uh, but bird seed as well. You know, uh, the deer love bird seed. And, and the, the lions are more or less following the big game. So wherever you see a lot of deer or a lot of turkeys or a lot of those little tiny European cottontails or even our native cottontails, you can just know that uh, it's a heavy lion use area as well. And uh, one of the coolest lion areas we have is Marshall Canyon. Uh, as you're going up to the ski area, um, 
there's just a lot of lion activity there. Like in the winter, sometimes you'll see where five different lions have crossed Marshall Creek Road. Um, Mount Deanstone up in Paddy Canyon. Uh, that old fellow I used to work with, Bob Wiesner, uh, he hunts for fun, you know, just chasing lions, doesn't harvest them. Uh, but he treed 11 different individual lions on Mount Deanstone two years ago. Yeah? So, are feral cats contributing to uh, predators coming in closer, do you think? Or is that kind of just incidental to everything else that we're adding into the system? Say that again? So, our, our feral cat population and then the owned cats that are outdoors, is that kind of contributing to predator shifts? Yes, a little bit, especially with lions. So if you're a, a cat lady or a cat man, like I've got a bunch of cats, just the fact that you have a lot of cats, especially the males, if they're pissing all over the place and you're living on the edge of town, you know, up against Mount Jumbo or up in the Rattlesnake, the lions are just going to, they're going to have to come in there. They want to scrape and pee on top of the house urination or the house cat urinations. So in a way, yes, if you, if you wanted to suck in every mountain lion in the country, you'd buy a house in a remote setting, you would put a big salt lick there, and then uh, you would get a lot of house cats, and you would be insured. Oh, chickens wouldn't hurt, turkeys, pheasants. <laughs> and then if you just really want to bring in every lion in the country, get a peacock. Because I don't know if you've heard peacock. But uh, they make the most god-awful sound. It sounds like someone's killing something, you know. And you can hear a peacock from five miles away if you have one on your ranch or your property. Yes? Um, you mentioned European cocktails. Are those little feral rabbits I see around town fairly? Yes, we've got the native ones, and they're awfully cute. But then we do have the European ones, too. And, you know, if you see a lot of white and brown and puffiness and prettiness, uh, more like more likely it's it's uh, the European uh, feral ones. And Grant Creek is a great place if you want to see millions of cottontails drive up like you're going to the snowball turnoff, and they keep going on up toward Bench Road <laughs> at four in the morning. Millions of these little cottontails. You mentioned a lot of dogs have been killed. Uh, what circumstances? The dogs off leash on hiking trails, or dogs in, at their home in the yeah. yard, or what? So the most common breed that we get killed seems to be the Pomeranians. And my theory is that a Pomeranian looks like a yellow belly marmot. <laughs> you know, they're about the same size and the same color, so we're always seeing these Pomeranians getting taken. And uh, I even have had people you know, like working on a well or their sprinkler system with their little Pomeranian next to them, where you know, so there's a lion next to them, you know, grabs a little Pomeranian, takes off. The littler dogs are more vulnerable, but then foxes, coyotes, owls will take the little dogs too. Um, and and uh, the bigger dogs that are killed by lions. Uh, yeah, it's like you don't want to chain them up. If you live in a real remote area, the last thing you want to do is have your dog in a little bunk house off the edge of the property on a chain. I had to respond to several of those where there's just a collar with a few bones, you know. Um, the big thing, yeah, is, is uh, if you let your dogs out in the early morning and there's always a lot of deer, you know, uh, the, chance there could be a lion out there. Uh, the, the little dogs that uh, are kind of cocky and take off after a lion, or take off after a bear, are more inclined to you know, get in trouble other than the wary ones. Uh, it's, it's relatively rare, but it, it's happened enough. Like since I've been working for fish and game, probably 30, 35 dogs that I can remember have been killed. Most of them are the small ones. Yeah? Um, you mentioned that you also kind of work with moose a little bit. Yeah, Can yeah, so moose, moose can be kind of frightening. In the rattlesnake, every year, 
you know, there's always a couple moose that kind of show up at the trailhead. And, you know, pretty soon they're down by the winery. And pretty soon they're in Bugby, you know, and pretty soon they're in Greeno. And then all of a sudden they're right here downtown, near the library. We've uh, uh, guarded a, a cow moose or a calf just across the street here. Uh, actually, right here is where we see a lot of bear activity, too. You know, they come out of Greeno Park and duck onto the interstate, and it's like, whoo! You know, they, they try to hole up in people's yards. But out in front of the library, they saw it, saw seen several bears already in the spring. Um, and then Paddy Canyon is another place where we see a lot of moose activity. Real good moose habitat up there, Paddy Canyon. And then uh, Big Flat, we see a lot of moose activity. And where the moose can get scary is it's kind of people go into the buffalo mode where, you know, they get really dumb. Something happens to them and they start walking toward a buffalo or a moose. And you're like, what the hell is wrong with these people? Uh, we get that with moose all the time. Uh, where people approach them. And then uh, the moose, you know, karate chop you. Uh, they'll run you over too. But when they get up on their hind legs, man, and their ears go back, that means get the hell out of it because they'll come, you know, with their front legs just smashing out at you. There's some videos on YouTube like that poor soul in, I think it was Anchorage, or was it Fairbanks? Some kids were teasing the moose, and uh, he came out of a shopping center and walked right into her, and she pummeled him to death. You know. So moose are, are big; they're like a horse. They can be pretty dangerous. I'm actually, I get more fearful when we have a moose in town than when we have a bear in town. Uh, most of our bears are just garbage-oriented or apple-oriented or natural food-oriented for the choke cherries, and they just learn to show displacement behavior or extreme tolerance, which is what habituation is. In order to use the food source, they pretend you don't exist. Just like they do with other bears, like the, the on the fishing streams in Alaska, you see that with the Kodiaks and the and coastal brown bears where they're extremely close to each other, but they have boundaries. You see that even in humans on the subways, you know, on buses, you know. Uh, you just become more tolerant when there's a lot of people around. Uh, and then bears become more tolerant when there's a lot of other bears and people around, you know. But then you always get that bottom ball, you know, that one that uh, maybe is a little predatory. The minute we see any bear that sort of exhibits that kind of behavior, boy, we're, we're right on them. But it's tough, you know, it's like this problem bear factory being run by a bunch of problem humans, you know, and they're manufacturing and training up these bears on a daily basis. We're just, until we can get some control on it and start with on a fresh slate, it's gonna just continue on. So that's what the Bear Smart program is. And, and on the Missoula Bears uh, website, there's a whole uh, Missoula Bear Smart tab that you can look into. You can read, we did a hazard assessment for the city of Missoula, we did a management plan for the city of Missoula, lots of cool stuff. So if there's a Bear Smart plan, is there a Moose Smart or online Smart so, plan also? No, not, not yet, but maybe down the road. If you wanted to look at a community that really has their act together, Canmore, look up Canmore. And uh, that's in Alberta, and I think that's the British uh, They are the only town in Canada. Bear Smart program originated in Canada. We've adopted the Bear Smart Canadian version here in Missoula, but they have now brought Bear Smart War 48 uh, down to Montana, Wyoming, Idaho, and it's a whole different program, very similar. We're modeling ours after the Canadian version, which is Canmore's version. Canmore is amazing. Like they have plans in place for moose, bear, lion, whole nine yards. They actually have 
wildlife movement corridors going through town and around town where people are not allowed to go into. It's just for the wild. Um, really, really fascinating. So that's, that's the closest town on earth that probably is sort of trying to do the harmony of the block. Um, what's your funniest encounter? Oh, uh, the strangest encounter I've ever had? Yeah, funniest or strangest? I could uh, tell you a bunch of them. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, so I had a really spooky one with a moose one time. Um, we were trapping down in Yellowstone uh, for grizzlies, and we weren't using horses, so we were having to carry all the rock meat and stuff on our backs. And every morning we'd get up early and we'd run this trap line. And it was a good 10 mile a day. Well, 20 mile a day, actually 10 miles up, 10 miles back. And uh, we were going back to the cabin. And uh, this bull moose, it was in September, late August. That was the rut, the beginning of the rut. And dang, he did start coming after us. And uh, uh, the one fellow I was with, was able to climb up a tree. I had my backpack on with the trap kit, so I couldn't climb the tree, but I ran into a bunch of dog hair, and he couldn't get at me because I was in this thick dog hair lodge pole. <laughs> but I was dodging him, you know, and we kept trying to figure out how to get around him, and he kept, you know, coming after us. And finally, we went way up on this ridge and came down and finally got into the meadow. And by this time, it was dark, and we were heading to the cabin, and then all of a sudden there he is coming out in the meadow after us. And uh, what we ended up doing was uh, we did call the park because uh, we were in the park, but we ended up having to shoot him in the hammer. And uh, it did knock him down. And uh, yeah, he did not come after us after that. <laughs> but we, we hit the antler enough, it was enough of a jolt where, you know, it, it brought him right down to the ground. So that was kind of scary. Uh, but then uh, I had a, uh, a trap set, um, and we had a trap up above us that we drove to, and we had caught this one grizzly, and we had this black bear coming in constantly, uh, and we were afraid the black bear might try to uh, kill or injure the female grizzly. So, I stayed at the lower trap site with her, thinking that I could, you know, run up a tree or whatever, you know, she started to revive, but I just wanted to make sure this black bear didn't come in. And uh, what we should have done was just kept the bear in the trap. Instead, what we did is had her outside the trap, and we wanted to catch another bear, so we had the, the trap set. And so I was watching her, you know, and, and the black bear didn't come in, I ran it off once and then I heard a noise and I thought it was their black bear coming in here instead it was uh, three grizzlies. It was a female with two big southern ones. Oh. And they were coming right in. I was like, oh my gosh. So I just ran right over to a tree and got up the tree and they didn't bother the female that was drunk. They came up, sniffed her, you know, I was fearful that they would maybe kill her, but they didn't. Uh, left her alone but then the cub went in the trap. So all of a sudden we got uh, a drug bear on the ground that's starting to revive. Uh, a yearling, you know, in the trap, yearling free ranging and a female free ranging. And I thought maybe I could scare him away, so I yelled and she came over the tree and started climbing up the tree. Oh. <laughs> but I had bear spray, you know, and I didn't spray her. She looked at me and then finally the fellow that I was working with came back down and he had to open a gate up above there and I was like, <laughs> and so he came down and got right to the bottom of the tree and I was able to slide down and get in the truck right away. And then the next morning uh, we were able to free dart the female, free dart the other little subadult and work the subadult in the trap and the other bear had moved on. So that was kind of spooky. But yeah, lots of, I can tell lots of, lots of, lots of stories. Awesome. Cool. Well, thank you so much.
I've got lots of PowerPoint presentations too. If you ever want to look at them, steal stuff out of them, sure steal stuff. <laughs> a lot of pictures. Well, I'm going to head out if that's okay. Yeah, thank you so much. Everybody is yeah. awesome. Nice meeting you. Thank you.